Paleo to Pioneer presents Small Batch Science, Episode 9. Happy Halloween! <laughs> Welcome to a special Halloween edition of Small Batch Science. Today we're going to skip to the pioneer end of Paleo to Pioneer, more or less, and talk about a little history of early photography, uh, issues with the early technology, and, and particularly the camera and their exposure times, and how that manifests in a collecting sub-discipline called Hidden Mothers. And there's some preposterous, ghoulish, horrific images we're going to show you soon. This is a pretty benign one, but years ago there was an era, or an epic, known as Before the Internet. And here you see a nice family reading the newspaper with pops in the middle and being watched over the jack by a jack-o'-lantern in the background. Um, the real issue that we're going to get into, and, we'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of skip a bit, but we'll come back to it, is that initially exposure times were incredibly long. The first photograph was taken in 1826 by a Frenchman named Napier. Um, it's on display at the University of Texas in the library, the Ransom Library, if you want to go have a look. It is basically the Paleolithic version of a photograph. It's a smudge. But we'll mention it again in a minute for a particular reason. Um, but Talbot in um, London give nearly simultaneously, both in January of 1839, speeches on what they call daguerreotypes. And there's a couple examples here. One of the things that came up was, and was suggested at the time, is that because the exposure times are so long and you might not be able to actually get a person to sit still, that art could be shared with the masses. And here's a nice example of a, a bust of Char uh, Charles Dickens. And a very timely sculpture of Ichabod Crane in a scene from The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Art and fossils. So, which is kind of interesting, here's a nice mastodon, because that's of course what we talk about here at Paleo de Pioneer. Mastodons all day, every day. And here's a image from probably the early, or late 1870s, early 1880s of Thebes in Egypt. Um, Lots of early archaeological sites are photographed in landscapes where there's nothing moving in them, and of course, fossils. This is a little bit later, but, but it, you get the idea. Uh, another thing that happened a lot of the time was uh, photographs of paintings, and in this case it's people that were never obviously around when photography was invented, so George and Martha Washington's paintings have been photographed, and that's how you could share those. Pretty early on, Photographers realized they could do trick photography, and for the life of me, I don't have another example, so I'm using one from um, William Dara's Stereoptic, or Stereo, Stereo View book. And he was really the dean of figuring all these things out, had an incredible collection years and years ago. But here you have a double exposure where two ladies are ghosted as angels watching over a little baby. And there's quite a number of those kind of things. Um, Napier's photograph in 1826 is the first photograph. And it's essentially photobombed because some person walked through the photo and is sort of seen as a streak walking through the photograph. Um, these are two particularly lovely 19th century examples of photobombing as well. Uh, this one is in the White Mountains of New Hampshire from the 1860s, might even be, or 1870s, probably, might even be 1869. I don't know if you can quite see him here, but hanging about 20 feet up in a tree by his arms, perpendicular, like he's a flag flapping in the wind, is a guy. So, a tiny little photo bomb in this lovely uh, um, landscape photo. This one's actually my favorite, from 1898, a story of you card showing Nelson Miles, General Nelson Miles, mounted on his horse. And somebody is working in the background, you can see where the ladder is, and the workman came over and squatted down, so a lovely example of this. But the idea here is, between the trick photography, photo bombs, um, and, and sort of goofing off, lots of very strange things in early photos, and, and, and one solution to, we can um, get photos of people, but the kids fidget too much, uh, ends up in, in what we have spread out across the rest of the table here. So um, I'll mention just a couple things here real quick, and we'll get on. Um, here's a, a few daguerreotypes 
some of the real early ones. They're basically a sheet of copper with a silver um, solution wiped over them. I confess I forget if there's album and the egg white essentially in these as well. I think that's what the trick is. Um, they're really hard to see if we rake them back and forth. Sometimes you can you can kind of see them, but um, they just vanish. You can be looking straight at it and not see it at all. Then um, one of the other very early forms of photography is um, ambrotypes. And this is actually a piece of glass where the the negative or the print, or the, the negative, the film is actually applied on the back side. I have no idea if you can see this or not, so it's all right. Um, and so when you look through the glass in like one of these cased photos, you're actually looking at a positive instead of a negative, as you would see from the other side. Um, I'm sure you can see why a lot of those don't survive. This one is not even in a case anymore. Another thing that's really sad about the earliest of early photography, even when you come um, past daguerreotypes and ambrotypes and get to a, a form that's called tintypes, and they are literally made of tin, and I forget how you do it, but there's a really simple way to determine if you're looking at a tintype instead of a daguerreotype. And oh, I meant to mention one other thing that I'm kind of interested in. Um, because photography becomes widespread and really takes off around the world, they're photographing people in, in Philadelphia and in across North America uh, by the end of 1839 is particularly the bigger daguerreotype and this tintype are of people that were born in the 18th century. So not, not a whole lot of those can survive and, and unfortunately for tintypes, ambrotypes, and daguerreotypes, um, a lot of times because they're in these cases nobody wrote anything down on them. So the photographer's information can is lost on virtually all of them, 90, 90 some percent. Um, and no idea who they are unless they were famous people that for some other reason were identified. So it's really kind of a, a sad aspect of it um, that, that from, say, 1860 and earlier photographs, it's not that common to have identification unless, you know, things still survive in a family album where they, where they show who they are. So our first Halloween tragedy is the loss of information, as is always true in history and archaeology. Moving right along. Exposure times at the beginning of photography are roughly on the order of 15 minutes. They very quickly get that down to a few seconds, even a second, um, and within a couple of years it's down to even a fraction of a second, which works great for adults who can be trained to stand and hold their grim face so you don't smile and, and wiggle. Um, there were, in fact, um, photographers would make a bar with a curled Thing at the back of it so you could stand in that and hold yourself in position. A lot of times you'll see people cheating either holding onto a post or a chair or standing by a chair hanging onto it. Um, but none of that worked with kids. And instead of being sensible Victorians and just sitting in the picture and making a nice little scene with grandma and the child or mom and the child or whoever like this or just something very sweet and cozy of mom and the baby, they pretended that mom didn't have to be in the photo. Sometimes, like in this case, uh, somebody is clapping at the babies to perform and apparently eating the apple is not part of the performance that they wanted. So, again, sensible Victorians, my foot. So the solutions we'll go through in ever-increasing absurdity to a grand finale that's really, really pretty funny. So, Babies fidget. How about we put mom behind the chair and hide her? Kind of. Maybe we don't have a chair and we'll just put mom behind the little table because that's so much better than just being in the photo with the kid. There's a couple more examples that are pretty ridiculous. Uh, here we got mom. The bigger kid's doing what he's supposed to, but the little one needs a little coaxing and the and the absurdity of mom's kneeling behind the the table and you see her feet and the legs and stuff but come on just be in the fun <laughs> all right so we'll skip a little here and get to another category of absurdity here is all right it's not working for mom to hold the baby from behind let's just put the baby in mom's lap and, and crop mom out of the photo sometimes you get pretty good a sizable proportion of mom is there and you can tell really easily who it is or that she's there. Here it's just the disembodied hand. Told you it was scary at Halloween. Behold. 
mom double clutches and two disembodied hands of baby sitting in mom's lap. Another entirely futile attempt to hide moms was using patriotic rugs or floral rugs and kind of hide mom and get to where you can't exactly see her but you sure know she's there. Sometimes I think they just sort of give up. And here's a series of those kind of things. All right, yeah, we got a lovely rug, but we're just going to cover your arm and you can reach out and grab Junior. Here, it's taking two people. We've got two hidden somebodies. One's grabbing Junior, and somebody else is holding props out of the way because this is clearly working so well. This is a favorite. It's a little hard to see the detail exactly, but what you're looking at is, in fact, Mom wearing a lovely Victorian velvet glove and choking him out. <laughs> Eventually, they get frustrated and just give up. There's, there's the hand of frustration. Here's a very rare hidden father, and Dad has clearly had enough. <laughs> this is not working, and you can see the kids ducking away. And these photos, like I say, start in the 1830s. I have some early examples. One tin type is probably 1860s, and go into the early 20th century. And part of that is the technology gets much better, and the shutter speed gets faster, and, and exposure is much slower, or much, I mean, sorry, much, yeah, much shorter. But um, some photographers, especially in remote areas, carry around old gear for a long, long time, and so they persist into the 20th century. Here's another example that I like of, uh, from the 18, from, I think, 1862. I'm not positive. I have to check. Um, just be in the photo, all right? You're just distracted from it at this point. But one of the things that's pretty fun is during, and, and makes it easy to date thing, date photographs, is that during the Civil War, starting in 1862 and running through about 1866, Internal Revenue started putting, uh, making everybody put stamps on, on photographs. And they were dependent on how much they, how much the photograph cost, how, what the denomination, the stamp, the tax stamp had to be. And this is an improper usage of a two cent banknote stamp. But again, sometimes the cancellation will tell you, and but just the stamp and, and the cancellation can tell you exactly how old these things are. All right, we're down in we're in the home stretch here. So sitting in mom's lap sometimes isn't quite as effective as we would hope, and so we can almost futilely attempt to hide mom. This is from Burnett, Texas, by S. C. Smith, probably 1880s image or so, maybe 1890s. Just preposterous. What are you doing? Okay, we can crop mom off, or we can just fade her out. So here's decapitated mom. Don't be scared. It's not related to Ichabod. This is not from Sleepy Hollow. And even, okay, so that was the whiteout version. Here are two tin types where they blacked out. Oh, jeez. And there's mom with the baby in the lap. Literally just chopped her head, <coughs> chopped her head off. Here's even more absurdity because the baby's clearly in mom's arm. You see all of her dress and all she <coughs> did is black out her face. It's ridiculous. There's, they're not sensible people. I don't know what they were doing. But here, oh, one last one before our piece de resistance. This is the only, in about 120 of these things that I have, the only hidden father I have. And you can see he's wearing a tie. So, again, the genre is called Hidden Mothers, but there can be others out there. I call this the cousin it formation, and this is the most absurd of absurd hidden mothers ever. Let's now put the rug over our arm. I'll hide under it, and the kids can sit on me, and nobody will even know I'm there. It'll look great. From Florida man to Texas woman, there's crazy people out there. Have a good Halloween. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Silva, and if you like these videos, please subscribe and give it a like.